right, let's go ahead and kick it off, shall we? So, hi, uh, I'm April. Uh, welcome to this amazing Women in Cycling webinar. Um, thanks so much for joining. Uh, I personally have worked in the sector for over 12 years with specialized bicycles, and I work with a lot of these amazing women, uh, particularly Laura, uh, representing uh, Cycling Industries Europe. Um, and over this time, I would say I have seen so many women come into the industry, but I've also seen our sector lose a lot of really smart women due to the lack of support. And I am really excited that this network exists because this is exactly the support that we need to keep these amazing talents in our industry and thriving. So again, I invite you, please keep your questions going, keep the participation up, and make sure uh, that you're participating on LinkedIn as well. And we will end up with a more diverse sector in the end. So looking forward to the conversation today. So we are going to kick off our program with a brief chat with Elke van der Brandt, the Brussels uh, Mobility Minister. So Elke, hi, welcome. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Yes. And so we have all seen the spectacular transformation in Brussels during your mandate. And we're kind of wondering what challenges have you experienced in trying to cater for more diversity in urban mobility? Well, the fact that it is changed. So we, if you talk about mobility, the streets is where people live. So it's really close to the daily reality of people. So changing is difficult. And if you see Brussels, how it is organized, we have an historical uh, organization, which is oriented to transporting cars and who's in the car, people going to work from nine to five, mostly men. So we have an infrastructure that's actually uh, very hegemonic around working men going to their jobs. Um, and so if you change, we, well, you, you have to take away some space to give away space to another um, way of, of transporting. And so that's very difficult. So you, you're touching at the status quo and that it's in itself is a difficult um, situation. Um, and in Brussels, what adds up is that if you really talk about cycling, specifically about cycling, because we have a history of bad infrastructure, who is cycling? It is mostly men who are sportive, who are quite young. So we see again that the, the profile of and, and the image of cyclist is, is very oriented as it's the, the, wild made, my, the white male going to work. So um, it is going against the stream about who has status, uh, what is status, a car means status. Um, and so there is a very cultural element and, and we're trying not only changing the street where people live, their daily habits, but also changing a cultural mindset in how do we organize city and how do we organize change in a city. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good point, what you mentioned about mindset. And I'm just curious, how are, how are we working towards or how can we achieve that shift in mindset and culture to achieve a more inclusive future mobility? Do you have any vision on that? It's doing two things. Um, to, to summarize, it's hardware and software. The hardware, it's building infrastructure, even if it's difficult, even if uh, there's a lot of uh, protests. But whenever we put a cycling lane in place, we see cyclists coming and we see more diversity on the on the bike. So we know that, for example, in the Netherlands and in Flanders, there's more women than men on a bike. It's different in Brussels. But whenever we put cycling lanes, we see that the women are coming. So investing in this infrastructure, in this hardware is crucial, but also investing in the software. We have programs um, of for people to learn how to ride a bike in a city because 10% of the population has never learned how to ride a bike. And so those courses, they are open for everybody, but we see that more than 90% are uh, women participating and often women who are motivated by being able to drive their children to school because their children want to cycle. And so this is a very intrinsic motivation. And we see that those courses have a really big impact in who's on a bike in empowering women because it does a lot more than just learning to bike it gives women if you, we have done some evaluations and women are also saying who participate i've had a success before the eyes of my children so it's really encouraging it's a kind of profile of women who uh, don't have a car don't so they are very depending on their their feet to walk around in the city so they say by learning how to cycle i have a broader 
spectrum where I can go, I can go further. Um, it gives them independence and also the courses themselves create um, women groups who stay together after. So you create very enforcing, empowering um, clubs of women who continue to cycle together. So this is a software that really makes a difference and it's not very much seen, but reality is that it puts different people on bikes and it creates this diversity. And so continuing to do boats is a challenge, but a challenge that we will uh, continue to do in Brussels. That's that's fantastic. I really love the idea of the uh, the hardware and the software and the idea around, you know, if you build the if you build the network, the community will come and that's creating that safe space uh, for them to thrive. So great. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, wonderful words. Thank you very much. All right. And next we're going to to move on uh, and we're going to start looking at the future. A little bit. We have three exciting speakers with us today to talk about women in cycling in 2024 and what we can all look forward to. So our first speaker uh, is going to be Laura from Cycling Industries Europe. Next, we'll have Ophélie from Femmes à Vélo in France and Isabel from Velo Concept in Germany. So we'll kick it off first with Laura. Thank you, Ilke, and thank you, April. Uh, what a start. Uh, and thank you for all of you to be part of our webinar today. It's amazing to see we had like uh, 600 and over 670 registrations. And Women in Cycling uh, was launched almost exactly three years ago. And it's fantastic to see uh, so many people here and so many people who want to actually change the sector and join forces and work on making our sector more uh, diverse. But let's have a look at our event uh, calendar for 2024 now. So please mark your calendars. These are all the like bigger in-person events. Of course, there's a lot more smaller webinars and activities uh, organized as well. We will hear soon what's happening with the national platforms, uh, but these are kind of the bigger uh, events, in-person events. So firstly, we're going to meet at Velocity in Ghent uh, on the 18th of June, and we have a Women in Cycling session just before lunchtime. Uh, and we're also looking into organizing that nice networking lunch right after this session. Uh, so hope to see many of you there. Uh, for Eurobike, we have secured the same nice uh, Friday morning breakfast spot uh, on 5th of July. And then uh, going more towards the autumn, we're going to have our CIA 2024 uh, summit on the 2nd of October. And just day prior that, uh, we're going to have CIA members day and organize a women in cycling uh, meeting there as well. So if you happen to be in Brussels uh, that day, you are warmly welcome uh, to join us too there. Then we have a new uh, activity. It's a kickoff for uh, women in cycling mountain biking, and that will happen at the IMBA Summit uh, in May. Uh, that event is really focused on getting more women into mountain biking and trail building and to suggest initiatives that can inspire and develop the participation of more women in the world of mountain biking. We will provide you a lot more information and details of all of these events and other events too uh, closer uh, to the date. Now, uh, we have created two practical tools to help making our sector more diverse. I read an interesting article uh, recently where a female leader or CEO of a big company said uh, that there are two key reasons uh, why uh, preventing or more women getting onto those leadership uh, seats. And number one of those is lack of networking. Men are much better. They take their old schoolmates. Uh, there are just far too many mediocre men in, in leading seats and, and far uh, not enough women. Uh, so lack of networking and secondly, uh, lack of support in terms of mentorship. And this is something we want to tackle uh, with women in cycling. And uh, that's why we have, uh, for this purpose, we have created our Women in Cycling LinkedIn group and expertise uh, portal. We have more than 2,300 women on our um, LinkedIn group. 
If you are not already part of it, you can join. You can, I think you can use that QR code on the slide uh, to join. We're going to also put that link for joining uh, on the chat box. So I hope many of you will be there. Please uh, continue uh, posting those job ads. Um, even, you know, if you're looking for a mentor, if you would like to be a mentor so that we can really tackle these, uh, these uh, obstacles on 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 the way of more women working in the sector in the way of giving you know more visibility uh, for women uh one of our goals at women in cycling is also no more manuals uh we many times hear when somebody is organizing a panel or an event they say you know we really wanted to have uh 50 percent women in the panel uh, but we just can't find them and this is why uh, we have created an expertise portal uh, where all the women uh, working for the sector can sign up. And um, so use it. And any of you, if you, you know, organizing events or you need women for jobs or board places or just for networking and mentorship, you can go and find the women on that platform. And please sign up also that we can just make it bigger and more powerful and help each other uh, forward. Now, I think it's time to have a little pause. I'm going to give the flow back to you, April. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Laura. Uh, and so this expertise poll, it's very uh, portal. It's very important. And so we actually want to know of all of the 310 participants on the call, how many of you have already signed up to be on the expertise portal? So we're going to launch this poll and please just uh, yes or no. Maybe some of you might be feeling some peer pressure if you just hit no. So maybe right after this webinar, you'll go and sign up very quickly because <laughs> we would love to have uh, your expertise added to our long list of experts so that we can uh, export that to all of the different events that we have coming up. And more importantly, to make sure that uh, those that are recruiters are looking at this portal uh, to understand where they might be able to um, uh, find find people to fill job openings. Okay, so we are about to see a big rush of people. Maybe we might even crash the website with all of the people that are going to have to sign up because only 11% of people uh, on the call are in the expertise portal. So I see that as a huge opportunity. So I'm glad we had this call. I'm glad we had this poll. And if you didn't see in the chat, the, the link for the expertise portal, it's here on the screen, it's in the chat, and it's very easily uh, found on uh, the LinkedIn page. So please make sure that you're um, signing up. All right, thanks for that. And next I'm gonna pass it to Ophélie. And she's going to give us uh, an update on the Women in Cycling platform in France. Hi, everyone. Thanks, April. Uh, my name is Ophélie Lafuge, and um, I am the founder of Beyond My Bike, a French online shop dedicated to urban cycling equipment for women. And I am one of the co-founders of the French association, uh, Les Femmes à Vélo which translates to uh, women on bikes for those of you who don't speak French. So um, pretty, pretty easy, les femmes à vélo. I'm very happy and uh, honored to present our association today here at the Women in Cycling webinar. So thank you again to uh, the Women in Cycling team. Thank you, Loha and, uh, and everyone for that. So let me start with um, a few words about our association, les femmes à vélo. We um, initiated Les Femmes à Vélo in uh, 2022 in Lyon, in France, where um, at that time, all of the co-founders uh, were living and where I still live, actually. And uh, if some of you know the city, it's a great city um, for cycling in France. So very glad to live in such a, a nice city in France. Um, even though we were all from Lyon, uh, actually, uh, our initiatives have a national scope. So we actually uh, have actions everywhere in France. Um, currently, our board is composed of six women 
living in different city um, in France, different cities in France. And our members um, are mainly working, uh, women working in the cycling industry, but also women passionate about cycling and willing to help us make a difference. Um, so in just in a few words, um, Les Femmes à Vélo uh, pursue two main missions. The first one is participating in promoting all forms of cycling for all women across France. And the second mission is supporting and advocating for women working in the cycling sector in France. For instance, we launched um, our first round of Afterworks events in 2022 in order to help women working in the cycling industry know and get in touch with each other. So, uh, Loha, you, with, you were just mentioning the lack of networking opportunities, and it's everywhere. It's the same in France. So um, I have to say that th those um, afterworks events um, have been very successful. And uh, since 2022, we've, we've organized um, some afterworks events in uh, many cities like Paris, Lyon, Strasbourg, uh, Grenoble, Nantes, and very soon in many more um, other cities. So that's a great opportunity for all women who work in the cycling industry to actually get in touch with each other. And um, to pursue those two missions, we collaborate and support existing initiatives uh, in France and also in Europe. And we speak up at events and everywhere our voice can be heard. So this year, in 2024, we are focusing our efforts on um, mainly two top priority actions. The first one is working with partners on a um, nationwide study to gather numbers about women in cycling, uh, women and cycling, because we strongly believe that uh, if we want to change uh, um, the, how, how it is now, we need first to actually measure and have numbers. So that's uh, the first, the first um, uh, top priority action that we, we are working on in 2024. And the second one is uh, launching the first um, national network for women who work in the cycling industry in France to help them grow together and make them uh, more visible. So that's also something that uh, many women that we met at our events actually were um, asking for. Like they want to know each other, they want to help each other. And for that, uh, we're going we're gonna to help them to do that in France. Uh, also, just um, a last word about one of um, our main actions that we've led uh, so far. We are very proud of uh, the manifest des femmes à vélo. Uh, that we presented a year ago on March 8, 2023. So this is a manifesto. It was in French, but it's also, we translated it um, in English. And uh, this manifesto has been endorsed by the Minister for Transport and the Minister for Sports in France. And uh, now it serves as the basis of all the actions that we take with the association. And uh, this manifesto was um, crafted by a collective of about 20 women uh, holding diverse roles. They were all working um, in different uh, cycling related positions and companies in France. And um, those 20 women actually gathered and worked on the manifesto together. And uh, through this manifesto, we strive for more space and more visibility for women both as cyclists and professionals in the cycling sector. And we ask for more diversity and more inclusivity. And uh, so far, the manifesto has gained support from over 1,500 people. And it's still available online on change.org. So I think that the link is probably in the chat somewhere, or we can actually share it with you. If you want to support this manifesto, you can still um, read it and sign it, sign it um, online on change.org. Um, so we are very, very, very happy to work on a closer collaboration now with uh, Women in Cycling, because obviously we share the same uh, values 
uh, we share the same passion and uh, we share we we share um, the same actually um, efforts. We come we, we should and we will combine our efforts to make more space and give more visibility to women uh, in the cycling sector. And um, we are very happy to uh, actually start this uh, collaboration and closer collaboration for uh, all the women in France and in Europe. So if you want more information about whether you are in France or not, even if you are in another country and maybe uh, you, are, you, you, you want to get some inspiration uh, from what we did in France, Please feel free to get in touch with me. I'd be I'd be very happy to to share what we've done so far and maybe to help you if I can. So um, get in touch with me or through our website lefamavelo.com. And um, yeah, we we can't wait to actually uh, work all together and uh, be more um, have a have a, have a greater impact for all women um, on Europe in Europe and in France. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Ophelia. Oh, look at that. Um, that was really inspiring. And I love a data led approach. You can never go wrong with starting with some facts and then uh, following it up with passion. And those two things are irrefutable at the end. So thanks for that. And next up, we have Isabel. And she's going to give us an update with VeloConcept and uh, the German Women in Cycling platform. Isabel? Hello. Yes. Thank you, April. And thank you, Ophelie. Thank you all. It's been an honor to be on this call and maybe to rephrase a little bit what Elke van den Brand said earlier. We as the woman, we have never been the problem. In fact, it's always been the structure that has been the problem for us. So after um, all what we did on the European level, being a founding member together with Laucha, together with Caroline, together with uh, Mobicon, um, it was time for us at last year's Velo City in Leipzig to uh, look abroad, to look to other nations, to look to France. We were very much inspired by Fama Velo. We looked to the Netherlands, to Wales. We looked, looked to Italy and to the Fancy Woman Bike Ride. So we saw all these initiatives and we heard about Sally. I will not go too much into detail because she will explain her facts later on. And that was very much the starting point together with the Eurobike Breakfast of last year that we thought, Okay, we have to push forward on the national level because if we want to if we want to tackle structural change, we have to put it into a structural national framework. And um, we are at the very early beginning. So here you see a picture from the Women in Cycling Germany kickoff from 19th of January. You see almost a hundred uh, women who showed up to this workshop event. And what's unique about it? It's women from the cycling industry, from you know retail, from brands, from manufacturers, from service providers. It's people from public authorities on the city, regional or national level. It's uh, women from science, from media, from civil society, from sports, from tourism, from all kinds of sectors. And um, that was very much unique. And um, what we try to tackle on the Women in Cycling Germany, that's very much embodied and embroidered into the European level. So we want to learn from our sisters, not only in Europe, please also beyond Europe, we want to bring this network also beyond Europe. But we believe that when it comes to our two main pillars, first one is the individual empowerment. Sometimes language can be a barrier and women want to network in their own language. Maybe women want to find a job in their country, maybe even in their region. So we very much want to focus on this individual empowerment, focusing on mentoring and networking. We want to create regional hubs all across Germany. So if you dial in from Germany and if you want to set up a hub, get in touch with us. And maybe the bigger one, the bigger picture will be the structural change. So what Ophelie mentioned, also what April, what you stressed about the data gap and especially the gender data gap, um, that's really the first thing that we also want to conduct. We want to set a, a baseline study, finding out how many women work in the sector, on what positions do they work, how many women cycling, cycle to what extent, why, well, what are the barriers. And um, so we really want to close this gender data gap first, but we also want to address the gender pay gap. We want to address feminist um, city planning and feminist infrastructural design. And we also want to, you know, for this different target groups, 
from public authorities up to industry, how can they better work together to be at the decision-making tables where the biggest decisions are being made. And um, we also had this woman who said, I want to be the next transport minister of Germany and I want to be, and I want this network to help me become um, in an automobile focused country to have a bicycle uh, minister of transport on the national level. I think that would be an ideal goal for us. That's future, that's not 2024. And um, yeah, maybe um, to say that we are at the very beginning we have a LinkedIn group with only 200 members. So if you're from Germany, please dial in. I'll, I'll share the link in the chat in a minute. And um, what's also interesting to address is that we are addressing women working in the sector, but also on the decision-making levels. And we also address people, or especially women on the, on the streets. And we also want to network with other groups in order to you know, foster more diversity even beyond the um, female and the women aspect. And um, maybe to round up, and before I hand back to April, um, this event also takes place because we had International Women's Day last Friday. It was the 113th Women's Day, and it was the fifth time that it was a public holiday in Berlin. And so I think we can change a lot of things. And it's also nice to be aware that in two German regions, uh, International Women's Day is a national holiday, and that may, may that may be also a nice inspiration for others um, to tackle this. With this, I hand back to April. That's amazing. And I, I did see a question in the chat around how can you be a part of Women in Cycling? Please go to LinkedIn, and it's Women in Cycling, and that's where you can join, uh, and you'll get all of the updates uh, through through LinkedIn. That's the, the main platform for the network. Uh, so thanks to all of you for, for our updates. And next, I'm going to introduce our uh, our main act, if you will, uh, talking about data and using a data-driven approach. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Sally Middlemiss. She's here to present the key findings of the, the UK-British Associ Bicycling Association Diversity in the Cycling Sector Study. Um, so Sally is the founder of the UK Bicycle Association's uh, diversity in the cycling industry program, and she's also the co-author of two key cycling industry diversity reports. So she is no stranger to this. She's leading the way uh, for the UK, and she was also the first female director of the Bicycle Association and was uh, previously a company director at a large independent UK cycling retailer. So Sally, thank you so much for joining us, and I look forward to hearing these uh, these key takeaways that you're going to share with us today. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of everyone, really, who took part in this international perception survey on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the cycling industry. So thank you for the opportunity, to, really, to share its key messages and um, hopefully give some context to the panel discussion coming up next. And thank you also to John Worthington from the UK Bicycle Association, who co-authored this report um, and indeed provided uh, much of the detailed analysis. So I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes answering these four questions. Uh, the, the first two questions, really the why and the who, I'm going to address quickly. Um, but, you know, I do feel these are important to cover, really, to help you all contextualize the survey. Mainly, though, I'm going to be addressing the what and the how. Um, what were the key findings um, from this survey? And most importantly, how can we use these findings to drive real change in our industry? But first, um, a slightly different question. Um, why does diversity matter? So I just wanted to pick this one off first because this is clearly such an important question, you know, may maybe the most important question of them all. Um, and although I don't have time to, di uh, to directly answer it today, um, I have written a detailed report making the business case for diversity in the cycling industry, including this one pager with all the key stats so please do make use of this free resource. You've got the URL there and I'm sure it can be shared afterwards or in the chat. So then on to our first question, why, why an international perception survey? Um, this survey was carried out as part of a wider program um, launched by the UK 
Bicycle Association last year, in fact, a year ago on International Women's Day. Um, and when I launched this program, I aligned it with McKinsey's DEI Lighthouses model. And I would recommend this five point model to any organization looking to implement an evidence base. So um, we've, a couple of us have mentioned already the importance of being data led. So a real evidence based data led DEI strategy um, with real impact. So the objective then of this survey was to support points one and two of McKinsey's model to gather data, to build up a really nuanced understanding of the root causes. Um, so as to be able to meaningfully define success in our industry and then prioritize future activity because you can't do everything in one go, you know, you need to prioritize. Um, and final point I just wanted to make here was really to underline the importance of an international data set. And I think, you know, further evidence of, of that today with the really global um, set of attendees here at the webinar, you know, the cycle industry is completely globally interconnected. Supply chains, you know, they often cross countries and continents even. So um, it was really great to be able to partner with women in cycling um, from the UK and and with indeed with, with women in cycling's international network to really be able to extend the reach and the relevance of this survey. So on to question two then, who were the 1,123 survey respondents? I imagine some of those are on this call today even. Um, there, I'm gonna race through this really quickly, by the way. And you know, in, this, in the report, there's a lot more detail um, around the demographics of um, respondents, but I'll race you through it before I move on to the, to the results. So there was a good balance of participants across the globe, um, although the biggest group was British. Um, I should also say, in case you're busy adding up the totals here, um, some of them do add up to slightly more than 100%. Um, you haven't uh, added up incorrectly there. And <laughs> um, that's because some respondents um, did in fact select more than one region because they work you know, across, across more than one. Um, there was a broad cross section of the industry uh, represented in this survey, again, just like we've seen on this webinar today. So, you know, people working in the industry, proper retailers, suppliers, brands, logistics companies, service providers, bike rental companies, and also working in the wider cycle sector. So whether that was in campaign groups, government, education, training, media, so really a really broad cross section uh, of the industry represented. Women were over-indexed um, as a population sample a bit, and especially compared with the numbers working in the industry today. So 56% of respondents identified as women, 4% as non-binary. There was a good balance across different age groups, um, and compared with the UK population, at least, there's a broadly representative sample um, in terms of ethnicity, sexual orientation, and disability. So that's really quickly taking you through who the respondents were. And again, um, as I said before, lots more detail in the survey report itself. So what were the key findings then? Uh, in the report, we present these as issues and consequences. So starting with the issues, um, the survey indicates a striking lack of diversity in in senior leadership. No surprise there, I don't think. Um, but the value of doing a detailed perception survey like this is that we can then build a detailed picture of the root causes, those nuanced root causes. And this survey tells a pretty stark, depressing story actually um, of ambitious, values-driven women, people of color, people with disabilities, people who identify as other than heterosexual, in other words, marginalized groups within our industry today. These people have joined the cycle industry to make a positive difference to society. That's, that's what they've told us directly in this report. When they join, they have a real desire to progress and develop their careers in the industry, but far too many are discovering a culture that isn't inclusive, whether that's microaggressions, harassment, bullying, other forms of discrimination and unacceptable behavior. So for example, nearly one in two people with disabilities keep these disabilities hidden from their employer. 
only 52% of respondents who identified as other than white felt free to be themselves at work. That compared with 84% of white people who answered this survey. This is then exacerbated by an organizational structure which does not treat these groups fairly and places multiple barriers in the way of their career progression. Again, this is what people who responded to this survey are, are telling us in their own words. The numbers of respondents reporting unfair treatment are really significant. So around one in two ethnic minority, non-heterosexual and disabled respondents say they have um, had unfair treatment. One in two, they, these numbers are huge. Then only 50% of women believe people are paid equally in their organization. And that compares with over two thirds of men. Our industry, in short, our industry is failing all of these people every single day. Um, and you know, it's worth reminding ourselves that behind these numbers and stats are real people's stories. So I've included a few of them there on the slide that you're looking at now, and you can find many more in the full report. Moving on then, the unsurprising consequences of all of these barriers and lack of opportunities, then combined with the negative, sometimes hostile culture that certain groups are confronting, is that just as April said right back at the beginning, too many of these people are leaving the industry, which perpetuates that issue. You know, the stats on retention are really shocking. You know, over half of new entrants expect to leave the industry within five years. And a huge 71% of female respondents are considering leaving. That's massively higher than the equivalent number uh, reported in the automotive industry. And again, you can read there some of those um, respondents' real experiences. So onto the most important part, how can we drive real change in our industry? Our survey asked, what change did people want? And these were the top seven across all of those 1,123 respondents. So number one, lead an inclusive anti-discriminatory culture. Number two, implement a bullying and harassment policy. Number three, diversify leadership teams. Number four, make pay equitable. Number five, offer career development to everyone. Number six, introduce flexible working and paid leave. And number seven, give more visibility to marginalized groups. So that's the top seven actions as identified by everybody who responded to the survey. But when we analyze those results, a little further, we found that different groups gave different weighting to each of these actions. So, for example, women were much more likely to prioritise concrete, measurable actions like gender balanced senior leadership teams, which was the number one priority for women, equitable pay, flexible working, whereas men preferred softer, less specific actions to improve culture, like, for example, raising awareness of cycling as a career for a broader range of people, or being more open-minded and transparent when recruiting. Uh, so going back to those individual responses, I think um, the quote in pink that I have included, I'm not going to read it out because I'm going to move on, but I think that um, that's a real powerful call to action for the industry for me. No more window dressing. So then returning to the McKinsey light houses model, we can see that point three in that model calls for exactly what the women in our survey have called for, accountable and invested leaders. Um, so for me, and I say this as a former director of a UK cycle retail business, for me, accountability is absolutely fundamental to achieving real meaningful change. Unless and until we see our senior industry leaders and I mean those right at the top, those who are accountable for reporting into the board on outputs, so not just inputs or activities, but measurable progress on diversity, equity and inclusion, 
versus targets that have been set already. I predict, unfortunately, we won't see change at the meaningful scale that we want and, and deserve to see it. So to summarize then, this report identifies really three key areas, which is you know, within those seven, three key areas where change needs to happen. It's around culture, it's around representation, and it's around accountability. But for me, accountability underpins all of the change that needs to happen. Um, because as we know, what gets measured gets done. And when we lack diversity in so many of those boards today, then I think we shouldn't underestimate the size of that challenge. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing the panel's reflections on this coming up next. Um, and happy to take a few questions. Um, I know and I will need to move on in a moment, but um, there's my daughter. She's my own personal motivation for driving change. Um, thank you. Sally, that uh, accountability and when we when there's not enough of us, sometimes we don't feel like we can hold those above us accountable. It's a, it's very hard to speak out when you're the only one in the room. So thanks for, for bringing this data-led approach. And now I'm going to pass it off to uh, Dagmar. She's going to go ahead and start with the Q&A. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, April. Thank you, Sally, for, for these insights and sharing um what you could find out about diversity in the workplace. So let's keep this focus for, for a little longer because there are so many aspects that all of us uh, can relate to, whether it's bike share, I saw that in the chat or uh, user groups that, you know, this diversity topic and it goes far beyond women. So there is so much. We have uh, just time for um, two questions, but there has been one in the chat I'd definitely like to um, bring on to you because you've been talking about accountability and um, someone has been asking what, does women empowerment look like concretely? Or if, if it's not in your own organization, um, what can it look like ideally? So how can that be happen? Can you draw that picture a little bit, Sally? Make sure I understand the question. So could you just repeat the beginning part of it again? How does uh, women empowerment look like? Or how can it look like? How can we make uh, create this cultural changes you've been talking about or make? Uh, those above us accountable. Yeah, I mean, what would... I think um, to go back to those seven key actions for change, you know, I think, you know, if you look at the way that we approached this, um, we took the, the five um, points in the DEI lighthouses approach. And, I, you know, we've mentioned it lots of times already, haven't we? Having a data led um having a data-led model where you first do look to understand what those underlying issues are. So why is it that women aren't feeling empowered? You know, I think we, it's it often, as um, April has mentioned, it's around, you know, the, the representation. And if you're the only person in the room, whether you can feel empowered to, to, to call out some of those uh, behaviors that are acceptable, um, but, uh, you know, in, in terms of, it's, it's a really difficult question to answer in, um, you know, in, in, within the context of um, a quick Q&A, but I can um, highlight if, if people are looking for um, uh, models and action plans, then on the Bicycle Association website, there is a 10 point DEI action plan, which somebody can take to their organization and ask to be reviewed and implemented um, by the board. Um, so, you know, it's hard, it's hard for me to understand the context of that question. Um, but if, if somebody's looking for specific actions to help empowerment, then um, perhaps that can be a useful guide. Yeah, thanks, Sally. So there are more resources out there. And also resources is, yes, your presentation will be uh, made available. And also the full report is available uh, online. Maybe someone can um, share that link to the chat so everyone can access it as well. Thanks a lot, Sally. We'll want to put some stories and concrete uh, experience behind the figures that you have just presented us. And we're like, such an amazing room at this very moment. There are like 
I saw that in, in the participants list and amazing women and some men also in, in the group pleased to introduce behind those numbers that we just heard. What laid what we heard from the industry survey from um, from Sally into the different cycling areas like the industry, what's the implication or what does that mean in planning and politics? What does it mean in administrations or advocacy? So we the whole cycling world and industry is very broad. Um, and you see the panelists on stage before I introduce them. Uh, I just want to say my name, I'm Dagmar Köhler. I work for Mobicon. I'm uh, located in Berlin. And here we go with uh, two Carolines to start with. We have Caroline von Ronterkim from uh, the bike share company 15. Uh, hello to France. Um, there is Caroline Serfontaine in Brussels from the European Cyclists uh, Federation. She's um, an absolutely advocacy expert, so that's going to be interesting. I'm also thrilled to welcome Roberta Frisoni, um, an economist and transport expert and the deputy mayor of urban planning and transport in the municipality of Rimini, one of the most notable seaside resorts in Europe, and uh, also in charge of beaches, by the way. So um, that's great. And very pleased to welcome Keisha Alena Mayuga, an urban planner from the Philippines, based in Berlin at the moment. And uh, she's been one of the driving forces for cycling in the Philippines and recognized as one of the remarkable uh, feminine voices in transport. So that's an area where you might have heard of Keisha before. So I'd like to, so very warm welcome to this absolutely fantastic panel. Um, let's have a reflection on what we have just heard. Caroline um, from 15, um, you're an entrepreneur, you're a director position at 15 as a female, director, you are also in a certain yeah, a minority being on top and on a top position in the cycling industry. Um, what caught your attention of what uh, Sally presented? Was there anything that you just heard that you surprised you? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, what uh, caught my attention are, are actually two stats. Um, one stat was saying that only 8% of women uh, um, have uh, workshop roles. And as you mentioned, I'm uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a director at 15 and it's a bike share company um, uh, and it, we are actually a lot of managing uh, women in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the company but very few of them are part of our tech team whereas our tech team is three-fourths of our entire employees and so we have 30% of women but all of them are in administrative role, and some are uh, in um, uh, in a direct directing production. But, uh, sorry, <laughs> in a in a in a directing position, but that's mainly because our uh, main um, uh, our, our founder uh, Amira is a woman. She is a part of a marginalized marginalized group. Our um, CEO as well um, is from a, a diverse origin. And both of them have made uh, clear to uh, raise women uh, on top position, but that's only true within our support uh, team. I mean, like the sales team, the accounting team, etc. And we still struggle, even though we have such, uh, uh, I would say, a, a willing uh, um, direction, um, as CEOs and, and, and directors, it's still hard for us to recruit within our, our tech team. So that, that was the, the first uh, uh, thing I wanted to say. And what we experience in the bike share world is uh, that on the other side, uh, because our goal as bike share company is to make uh, people uh, tr uh, try bikes and, and, and go from all the modes uh, especially cars, to becoming lifelong cyclists. We are the, that in-between um, uh, service that will help people to test cycling and become lifelong cyclists. Today, we only have 44% uh, of women users. This is part of, it's not part, uh, only 15, but all the services in France. We have run the study uh, last year on all bike share services in France. And for long-term rental, it, it reaches to 62%. Uh, why? Because long-term rental, you often have 
more diverse bikes available, uh, long tail, cargo bikes, etc., which, which, which doesn't exist in the short-term rental services. So that's probably why we reach uh, such, a, such a number. And what we believe is that if we had more uh, women designing those bikes, then more women behind the bike thinking the bike would probably also help to have more women on a bike. So having mm -hmm. more women within our team, within our tech team, thinking about our services will probably also help to increase uh, that figures. Yeah, it's interesting. You already make a strong point that it's not enough just to have an equal 50-50 share of, of uh, women and men, for example, in a company, but it really matters where they are. And interesting, uh, just let me drop a fact. Um, the aviation industry is actually within the transport industry, the ones with the highest uh, female share of women, 40%. But you will not be surprised that the majority of them works as flight attendants. And among pilots, the share of women is 2%. Yeah. In and, the and EU. So there we go. And I think this um, demonstrates an important part of the issue. And I would like to dive a little bit deeper into the question, why does it matter to be um, more diverse in, in, in the cycling workforce? Let's focus on the workforce for, for now, because we, uh, yeah, there's so much we could talk about otherwise. And I would love to um, turn to Roberta Frisoni to, to Italy. We have heard Elke van den Brand in the beginning in this real fire chat. This was totally to the point, a very little time. But it's so great she was here to share her tremendous work. She was very eager to join this webinar. She's a proud woman in cycling. And she has uh, worked or she is working hard to, to develop Brussels for a more variety of needs. And you, uh, Roberta, you are doing such efforts in the city of Rimini. I think one of your biggest projects at the moment is to regenerate a 15 kilometer uh, stretch at the waterfront to place this uh, from a place dominated by car infrastructure into an accessible place that includes access by bike and foot, uh, but also urban playgrounds. And I was, uh, two questions, what makes a playground inclusive? And second, do we need women in political power in order to cater for kids and in order to cater for more diverse needs than a straight one direct commute? Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. As I said, I'm really excited of being here. Uh, yes, in Rimini, we are doing a, a complete regeneration of our waterfront. Uh, we have 15 kilometers of uh, something that used to be a street and parking, and now is a, a sea park with green and uh, cycling routes and playgrounds for kids and also elderly people, because we, we like to be inclusive. By definition, we are a tourist place. Uh, maybe someone of you might know us. We are on the Adriatic Sea and a well-known beach destination. Uh, but we, we have also nice uh, monuments and culture in our city center. Um, well, we have decided 10 years ago to reshape our city, starting from the city center and the waterfront. And uh, what the, the, the highest challenge is that we are taking away a lot of cars uh, and making people go by bike or by trans public transport to the beach. Uh, what we are doing is uh, to create an infrastructure that is good for everyone. And, and I think that being... Uh, I am a woman, of course, and a lot of my colleagues and uh, technicians, directors of this uh, uh, fantastic project are women. And uh, we look at things probably in a different way. We have kids, uh, we have mothers that uh, maybe go with their electric bikes going shopping, and we know that we need to have safe infrastructure, first of all. So um, the, our, um, our site is really um, moves towards uh, having our kids going safe to the beach or going safe to the city center. And I think this is um, paying a lot because tourists that uh, are coming to our city and now see the difference, uh, they feel safe uh, and cycling and walking uh, along our uh, waterfront. And uh, the, the, the nice thing is that uh, uh, we are also creating a lot of playgrounds uh, because we want to be active and uh, uh, prom promote well-being uh, and healthy. And our playgrounds uh, are have been shaped in a way that you might have your playgrounds for little kids uh, from three to six, let's say, 
And close to that, you have uh, an open air gym for uh, uh, parents, for mothers and fathers, or for also uh, um, uncles that want to get fit, but looking at their children, enjoying uh, movement nearby. And this is something that is working really because uh, uh, we have we are creating new places uh, um, where people socialize, they meet, uh, they do different things, uh, and uh, we, we keep um, together. So this is a, a very something that we are really and I'm really proud of. Uh, and yes, I think that uh, it's very important to have uh, women in, in key roles. Uh, uh, because uh, of course uh, we have different uh, different perspective. Uh, probably also a lot of men can uh, do have this perspective, and so uh, I, I always say that it's not only a gender point. Let's say, but uh, for sure you need to have uh, on your skin an experience that make you looking things in a different way. So for me, this is the most important thing. Having tried uh, on yourself uh, some uh, problems, some issues some opportunities, some challenges, uh, and uh, for sure women more than others uh, or in their lives have taken care of other people. And this taking care makes you looking things in a different way. Yeah, very strong message. The diversity of experiences be behind, that's, uh, that's a big eye opener. Let's take a look, uh, Keisha. When COVID hit the world in 2020 and uh, public transit came to a hold in many places around the world, including at the Philippines, where you lived in Manila um, at the time. So a lot of people were suddenly unable to get around and you were among those that were thinking, okay, let's get people on their bikes. Let's start initiatives that first of all, people have access to bikes and secondly, that uh, there are bike lanes where, where they can cycle. And you say, actually, this has a significant gender and diversity dimension. Can you explain this a little bit, Keisha? Yeah, so like you explained, it wasn't really pre-pandemic, just to explain to everybody also. In the Philippines, not a lot of people cycled. Basically, cyclists were invisible, and I was one of the invisible cyclists there. Um, oh, and yes, this photo, which I will give context to in a bit. But yes, basically, women uh, cyclists were invisible and more who were more invisible women cyclists. And I would count like for every 15 cyclists, one woman um, in a 40 minute or 30 minute trip. And that's not a lot of people. So um, yeah, when this happened, actually, when the pandemic happened, it was a golden opportunity for everybody, um, including the Philippines to really promote cycling. And so we a proposed a pop-up bike lane by we I mean it was a um, group of advocates which later on would become the Move Us One coalition who are made up of um, people who are just interested in transport so that students young people people who were seasoned or had a lot of experience people from different sectors um, we all came together and said hey you know what how can we make it safer for a lot of people um, in the long run let's put up a pop-up bike lane so we end up in this room where um, we were in front of the authorities, mostly male, and we were practically begging, please, please, let's try to do this pop-up bike lane just for a week and just for a few kilometers. And they were, it was really difficult because this was unthinkable for them. But um, what happened in that room was uh, they kept addressing one of the um, one of the male or one of the men who we were with and if it were not for him telling everybody no let's listen to Keisha she knows what she's talking about um she has the idea so it had to take a man to tell the other men you know what there's another idea out there and maybe we should try it and so because of that we were able to do this pop-up bike lane which you can see there on the left um which eventually they also shut down <laughs> because for one reason or another, they just found a reason to shut down and we thought it was a failure. Uh, but because of the work that we continued doing with this group, uh, Move Us One Coalition and also other cycling groups, other people from different industries, from government, from, um, from the private sector, from different backgrounds, because of that, um, we were able to help and achieve this 500 new kilometers of bike lanes that we've never even as a country 
ever had before. And we had to start from the start. So if you could see that's a one year difference from the left and right, that's what we were able to achieve because people were able to open their minds and say, hey, you know what? Maybe other people have ideas. And I think that's what diversity brings. Um, I mean, it's not even now, like as a gateway for women, um, for people to recognize diversity, women as women, we have um, a chance and a voice to open this world up for other people. Um, for example, persons with disabilities, people who are coming from the, not from the city, people who have different backgrounds. And um, I like what Sally said when she said, give more visibility to marginalized groups in the seven actions for change, because that could really bring in like not just a diverse group of people with different perspectives, but also a lot of empathy. And that's the kind of planning that we need when we're thinking about planning for people who are cycling, because it's not just women who are cycling, it's women with children, it's pregnant women, it's women with disabilities um, and other different types. So I think when we're uh, talking about diversity in cycling, we have to um, remember who are we, who else are we excluding? And just also to say, and to answer that horse question, this Move Us One Coalition and also other cycling groups have been spearheaded by a lot of young women in particular who are still fighting for better space, uh, better transport um, in the Philippines. And I, I think some of them are also in the chat spamming probably, but yeah. Um, and if it were not for people who were in power or people or men to, to give the space for women or for people who are invisible uh, to speak up, it wouldn't have happened. So if you are a person in power or if you are a man or if you are somewhere up there and you can give an opportunity to someone to speak up who is deemed to be invisible, I think you should do it. No matter what industry, no matter where you're working, no matter where you are in the world, I think it would do a great justice for everybody. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, goosebump uh, speech, Keisha. Thank you so much. And I think we can all be very honest uh, in a qu quiet moment. We should really, as you suggest, all ask ourselves, who else are we excluding? We are not trained towards diversity, neither. Uh, how much pluralism, does, pluralism do we all actually allow in? How much variety in the chat can we accept uh, in a in a webinar? Um, I, yeah, absolutely. Um, goosebump what you were saying, I think. We should also take a look uh, into this field of actions that you that you already mentioned. Um, what are the actions that we can do to increase the diversity now that we have some more facts and understanding of why we need this? And Caroline, um, going to Brussels, going to you, the ECF represents the National Cycling Advocacy Organizations and then eventually the users, but also um, who represents the users uh, on different on different levels, on different political levels, the national levels, the European level. Have you seen any change in the representation of cyclists in recent years? Yeah, thank you so much, Dagmar. I'm so happy to be here surrounded by these amazing women that have done so much. And I must say the cycling advocacy sector has changed quite a lot. I, I started working at the European Cyclist Federation in 2020, and I remember quite clearly in one of the first weeks I started working there, I had a conversation with uh, one of the, the CEOs of a very large um, cycling advocacy organization in Europe, and it was a man, and he said, like, you know, this sector is about to change because it started all off with white angry males that were fighting to somehow get cycling in the urban mobility agenda. But now I think we've gone as far as we can. We need more diversity um, and we need more women so that we can get further and get more inclusive in, 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 in the way we're doing advocacy. And I had a look at the 12 largest ECF members and I'm very proud and happy to report that six of them changed from a man CEO to a, a woman CEO, and three of them renewed the experience of having a woman CEO, um, which shows that there is quite some change going on, moving on from the, the white angry male to getting, uh, giving over the leadership roles to, to, to more women and also at the European Cyclist Federation ourselves. Um, we have the first female CEO, Jill Warren, uh, who's fantastic at, at what she does and who has also diversified the ECF um, uh, staff 
But um, also, if you look at our board, for, for example, in 2020, it was six men against two women, and now it's parity with four women and four men. And I think it's so important to just um, have this diversity because it will bring us further in any negotiation that we will do. Because I th simply think that women start with the approach of cooperation versus the approach of competition. We see more like how can we work together maybe with other sustainable transport modes to uh, transform mobility in cities versus the bicycle is the only way to go and 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 we, we we should fight only for the rights of the bicycle. So I think there's more cooperation that is done. There's more openness. There's a wider, more inclusive vision, um, which represents better also the change within the cycling users. So we see that everywhere where infrastructure is being built, um, that is safe. We see more women cycling, more elderly people uh, keeping on cycling, more more children. So I think it's quite important that this um, ever growing diverse group of cyclists is well represented within the advocacy organizations. And I can see the change and it's been really, really nice to be able to witness this firsthand. Yeah, great. It really matters who represents you and me and everyone else who, who is out there. And talking about um, the things we can do, we would like to invite all participants of the webinar to be uh, active once more before we have to come to a close here. Um, because Sally has presented seven areas of action and we will run another poll and we will uh, I'll ask you um, which of these areas of action are a priority for you? Maybe think about what can you do in your context or what, well, whether you can do it or not, but what do you think should be the priority to be done in the context you're living in, in your country or in your organization, in your context? And I will, while everyone takes some time to, to find the mouse and click on the right uh, ball, I would like to uh, address this question also to all of my wonderful panelists with whom I could continue discussing for another 20 hours with no problem, uh, but we do not have that time. Um, and I'll start with um, Roberta, followed by Keisha, and then the two Carolines. Uh, what is what is the priority action for you? Is it out of this list of leadership, um, corporate bullying and harassment policies, diversification of leadership teams, making pay equitable, more flexible working conditions? Or is it mentoring and training offers or generally more visibility for women and marginalized groups? Okay. So what is your... Pro yeah. Uh, starting from my experience in my country, I would definitely say more flexible, flexible working and paid leave because uh, in Italy we are, we are still uh, things to do in that respect. And uh, definitely what helped me a lot in carrying on my job uh, also as a, in politics, let's say, is a flexible working uh, and pay and pay. So yeah, I would say for Italy, I turn on that. Right, great. Uh, Keisha, what's your priority? Um, I think uh, I made it also clear earlier, it's really giving more visibility to women and marginalized groups because um, there are a lot of other people out there and we as women know what the feeling is of being invisible at one point or another. And um, there are other people out there and we have like what Sally said, blind spots that we may, might not be aware of. So maybe, you know, ask yourself also who else, who might we be excluding? Um, yeah, and it's a great question to ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, Caroline from 15. Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll pick um, diversified leadership for the reason I mentioned uh, earlier, because I believe in positive discrimination. If you have... Um, uh, leaders that are sensitive that have uh, that are part of a mar marginalized group, then they will be more likely to give hand to other people that are uh, that are uh, uh, like them. So I really believe that this will help a lot. And I would like to add something that um, uh, Elke uh, said about the developing the hardware. So it's not part of the the seven um, the, the seven action, but I think this is also very important. We talked about infrastructure, but we often forget that 
having the right bike is important and um, and developing the services around the bike is important and uh, I wanted to um, uh, to 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 uh, reflect on another uh, stat from the study that was saying that 73 percent of women living in cities have never ride a bike I was so scared by this and I believe bike share services have this as a role is to put those girls on bike. And for example, at 15, we develop a full electric bike share service. This is not only to be um, innovative or just for fun. We actually proved that having more electric bikes within schemes increases the number of women on the bikes. So, uh, and, and I, I'm talking about electric, but all different uh, characteristic and this also in the manifesto of Les Femmes à Vélo, it's important to think and I come back to having men engineer or women engineer, we change the way we design the bike. So that's also an action that I would like to, uh, to, to, to point out is develop the hardware, so either the infrastructure and the bike uh, in order to design an ecosystem that is secure and, and thought for women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to carry my child as well when I use a bike share. Uh, maybe that's something you can uh, bring forward, Caroline. Okay, before we see everyone's um, feedback, Caroline Safontaine, Brussels, what's your priority area? Yeah, for me, it, it would also be diversify the leadership teams because I believe that many of these other points, if we would have more diverse groups, um, these points would be taken care of, hopefully, like making pay equitable, more flexible working, uh, giving more visibility to women and other marginalized groups. So um, I'd, I'd pick, if I have to pick one of these seven very valid reasons, mm -hmm. I'd pick diversify leadership teams. Okay, and now let's see what everyone in the room says. What's the priority? Uh, I can see the results. I don't know if everyone can see them. We have a peak on diversifying leadership teams with 29% of respondents. That's the number one hit, followed by also a high share, 26 uh, respondents, more visibility for women in marginalized groups. Um, and 17% on position number three is leadership for inclusive anti-discriminatory cultures. Super interesting, but what do we do with that? And I the um, yeah, I'll thank this fantastic panel to the deepest. It's been wonderful to listen to you and I would love to listen to each of you for an entire webinar just uh, alone. Um, we cannot do this, unfortunately, but a virtual applause and thank you so much for joining. And I'm handing over to April. What do we do with this list of action now? Well, I'm pretty sure we all have a lot of inspiration and a lot of energy coming out of this. And I think the most important thing that we can do is one, keep the conversation going. So at the top of the show, you could say, uh, Lahua gave us a lot of really great events that we can attend that are going to be opportunities for us to network. So remember in May, we've got the IMBA Summit. So if you are interested in mountain biking, if you sell in mountain biking products, if you make mountain biking products, uh, if you're involved in trail building or trail advocacy, we want to see you there. Um, the leaders of that group are very uh, invested in bringing uh, the women and the female voice and a more diverse voice into mountain biking, particularly. We know that that's definitely a blind spot within our sector. Um, June, Velo City, another really important moment for us to get together and talk about infrastructure. Uh, as Elka had pointed out, we need to have that infrastructure in order to get the communities built. So that's a really great moment in time for us to connect. Eurobike in July, having the women's breakfast uh, with uh, hosted by Velo Concept. Thank you very much. And then October with, in Brussels with the CIE Summit. There are so many opportunities for us to continue this conversation. Um, and Sally gave us really great materials to share within our organization. Bring those to your people and culture or human resources team or to your manager even. How can we bring this to, to the group? Don't boil the ocean. We don't have to do big things all at once. But what's a small thing that you can do in your organization to be more inclusive? And I think we've got a lot of tools from today. So let's continue the conversation. Um, join the panelist uh, uh, group. Join the LinkedIn group. And we'll see you all hopefully in May at the IMBA Summit in Vienna. 
All right. Thanks, everyone.